latest COVID-19 outbreak? Well, I, I think anything, hopefully it forces them to come to the table more quickly to get whatever needs to be done, done. Now, in my perfect world, there would not be trade deals. I don't think government should be involved here. But anything to get it back on track as much as possible, whereas whereby American companies are producing, they tend to produce with Chinese companies, and it's a very harmonious relationship. And so obviously you have this very interconnected supply chain, and White House National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said, depending on how the outbreak develops, it may impact the size of the purchases in the current year. Have we seen any indication of that from China so far? It's hard to say, but it's, I think what we are seeing within all this, what, what you hit on is crucial, is that the only closed economy is the world economy. Uh, there is no an American economy. There is no Chinese economy. The U.S. economy is large and growing and incredibly dynamic precisely because of its interconnected nature with what's happening in China and vice versa. And so any attempt to plan who buys what I, I think is such a distraction for the greater thing. Let's acknowledge the more that they're integrated, the more growth in both countries. Now, we do know that there is a disaster-related clause in the deal, but it would require consultations. Now, that says that in the event of a natural disaster or other unforeseeable event outside of the control of the parties, delays that, delays that party from timely complying with its obligations under the agreement, the parties shall consult with each other. How likely is this, though, to happen? Obviously, we're seeing um, more cases every day, but how do you see that affecting whether or not they will implement this clause? Well, you would hope to see them implement it, but isn't it an interesting admission? If this clause is basically an admission from both sides that efforts to put up barriers to trade are by definition damaging to both sides. And it's a reminder that the most open country is always the most prosperous because the most open country is most interconnected, basically dividing up labor in the most optimal manner. And so it's hard to say if we're going to get to this point. If you look at history, it strikes me that a lot of these viruses create, there, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of worry. It's always sad to see people die, but what you sense that this won't be as, as economically or, or impactful as it's, it's expected to be. But wow, what an admission from both sides uh, that, that, that they realized that, uh, that they might have to, to basically uh, pull back on some of the limits to trade precisely because they're, they're damaging. So then how do you see this affecting China's ability to buy from other countries given its existing commitments under the phase one trade deal? Well, let's also always remember that you're only able to buy insofar as you're producing first. And so it's very clear that at least visually, China, the ability of the Chinese to produce over the last several weeks has been very much curtailed. And so the ability to purchase not just from the U.S. but from anyone is going to be curtailed. You cannot force consumption. Consumption is a consequence of production and anything that holds back the ability of the Chinese to produce in the feverish way they have is going to limit the ability not just for the U.S. but with other countries. Now obviously along with this phase one trade deal, a lot of promises in, in the agricultural sector um, in the U.S. Do you see this in any way affecting Trump politically in an election year if some of these promises perhaps can't be fulfilled because of the disruption? Uh, my sense, no, because I think this was always a, a political talk. There was a political aspect to this, and that I'm getting tough on China, that had nothing to do with the economy. The idea that you could, you could grow your economy by getting tough on a country that, that demands, that, it's, that people demand so much of U.S. plenty, was always laughable. So it was always a political concept. But what could clearly impact Trump is if a continued slowdown in China uh, continues to take place. Because let's not forget that Apple sells a fifth of its iPhones in China, Boeing sells a quarter of its planes, uh, McDonald's its second largest market is China, N uh, Nike's second largest market is China. There's what, 4,200 Starbucks there? Anything that harms China's economy, by definition, harms the U.S. economy and could, li could basically blunt Trump's message going into 2020. So then what should we be keeping an eye on then as this continues to unfold? What we should be keeping an eye on is hopefully an end to a lot of the, uh, what's the word, alarmism about this. I, I think it's fair to say that the Chinese uh, are, are a bit frustrated by some of the reporting in the U.S. that this has basically shut down the, ch the economy over there completely. Uh, U.S. State Department attempts to limit U.S. travel there. Anything like that is invariably going to be a bullseye back on the U.S. economy, or it's going to boomerang on it, simply because if China's not thriving, 
the U.S. can't. And just the same, if the U.S. is not thriving, neither can the Chinese economy thrive. So, I mean, that's the two biggest